Hey, nerdy knitters, welcome to another episode of the Knitting 411 podcast where we answer your knitting questions. And we have a lot to cover today. So grab your knitting and let's settle in for a good chat. We'll start with our knitting news. I found this article recently. There's a link right there on the screen for it if you want to read it for yourself. And a little blurb about from the article itself. Blackburn, a small town in the UK, it was a former mill town that was once the center of the global textile trade, but went into steep decline in the second half of the 20th century. They are now hosting what they call a curious little experiment in clothes making called homegrown homespun. And their plan is to create a garment entirely from local resources. And in the words of the organizers, to grow your own genes. So they're growing flax for linen, producing their own indigo dye. And they hope that this initiative will eventually lead to the birth of a local community of growers, spinners, weavers, and dyers producing high quality clothing that will not be as cheap as mass produced fast fashion, but will represent better value for money as it will last. And I just thought that was a really interesting article to have a whole community come together and create everything you need for textiles from beginning to end the dyeing, the weaving, the spinning, growing of the materials. I just thought that was really interesting. So if you're interested in reading more about their initiative, you can go to the link. All of the links for everything we discussed today will be down in the video description box. Um, so before we get to your knitting questions, I'll share a bit about what I've been knitting. My focus this week has been all about the master knitting program and the Fair Isle Tamp. I'm working on level three and for the final project we have to design and knit a hat and design and knit a sweater. And our only guidelines are one of them has to be a stranded color work pattern and the other one has to be an Aran pattern. So I chose to do an Aran sweater and a Fair Isle Tam. So you can see I've got a lot going on here. I've even knit a whole hat. This is just my prototype. This isn't the finished one I'll be sending in. But it's a bit of a story. I started, well, with a chart. This is one of the original charts I designed. This is not the final one. I've made a lot of changes to it just to get an idea of what I wanted to do. And I started with the number of segments. If you've ever seen a Tam, then you know that the top can be shaped in different ways and you can have all of these different segments these wheels or spokes that form the shape and they can be anywhere from like five or six up to even ten different spokes i decided to just do six um so i started with that knowing that i would have six wedges so i sort of did the math backwards i started with with that part and how i would create that shape and that gave me the stitch count i needed for the body of the hat itself and then I reversed that and then decided how many stitches I should remove for the brim after I did a gauge swatch. Now this is where things get interesting. I started with this swatch right here. I wanted to see how those decreases would work and I worked it in magic loop, which I knew I was going to do the project in the round, but for some reason it didn't cross my mind to remind myself that when I knit with magic loop, I tend to knit more tightly than I do if I knit something else in the round, larger things like a hat, um, which is fine for socks where I want a firmer gauge, but of course I don't want a really tight firm gauge for a hat. I want a nice gauge for the stranded color work, but I don't want really tight. And this felt really tight and I didn't like the way it looked. Um, so I figured, well, I'm just gonna go up a needle size and knit sort of a prototype hat. So that's what I did this week. I knit the whole hat, which came out nice. I don't really, the gauge is, is not, is still not right now. It's sort of too loose and the hat has like this weird curve. It's not really, it should be more flat across the top. It had like a weird bump before I blocked it out. But I do like the colors and the pattern. And the other thing I noticed, I, I lined up the patterns. So they would sort of progress. Like there's a diamond shaped here. So I lined it up with the diamond shape that was in the pattern above it. So they would all line up. But then I didn't notice is that it was off centered enough. So when I started my decreases, that the decrease line, which I wanted to be centered as well, is one stitch off from the center of the design right here. So I need to adjust that. I don't really like the way that looks either. 
And then I figured, well, I'm going to knit another swatch because I remembered that when I knit Magic Loop, I tend to knit more tightly. So I used the same size needles I used for this swatch to knit a second swatch. And this time I did like that faux knitting in the round. I cast on the same number of stitches as I did for the Magic Loop. But instead of joining like this and then cutting it open after, where I had like a small circumference to knit, I knit on the, the needles I plan to use for the hat itself. Instead of doing Magic Loop, I knit on the 16 inch circulars that I knew I'd use for the hat. And I would knit across the swatch and then I would carry the yarn across to the other side because I wanted to simulate knitting in the round without knitting a whole hat. So I carried that yarn across and then I would start the next row and carry that yarn across. That's why you end up with all of these bits on the end. So when I was finished, I took those strands and I cut right down the middle so I could open it and block it and take my gauge. And these are the same needle sizes oops, for these two swatches. They're the same exact except two different methods. For this, I used Magic Loop. For this, I used a 16 inch circular and treated it like I was going to treat the final project. And I think you can even tell from here the difference in gauge. This one sits, it's the same number of stitches. It was, it was 60 stitches for both of them. This one is curved under a little bit, but look how much smaller it is. Hopefully you can see that on the screen. Look how much smaller the dimensions for this one is. It's the same number of stitches, the same needle size, but I used two different methods. So I thought that was really interesting. So even with the same needle size, if you change the method you're using and switch from knitting something like a small circumference in the round, like magic loop or two circulars or double pointed needles, and then using just a regular circular needle, that can make a difference in your gauge. And this gauge matched more of what I wanted. And if I had done this originally, then I would have known that this is probably the size needle I would have wanted to use. And instead of going up a needle size for the hat, I did this on a US three and it was too tight. So I decided to go up to a US four for the hat, which was too loose. But when I re-swatched with the US three, but using a different method, I realized that that is the gauge I want on that US three. So I am starting, hopefully, hopefully the final TAM. So I've got to knit this and write up the pattern. And that will be one thing done for the master knitting program. The other thing that I noticed on this is my decreases. I used a central double decrease, which takes three stitches and turns it into one stitch. And I don't know if you can see right there, there's like a line of stitches that that's the stitch that ends up sitting on top in this decrease. And I really liked the way that looked, but I did this on, on double pointed needles. So half of these ended up between the two needles. Um, and you can see the stitch right there. I have really loose ladders. So every other wedge has this loose ladder because of the DPNs. So that was another thing I had to adjust. This one. The ones that were in the middle of the double pointed needles came out fine. But the ones that happened to fall on the end of the needle from switching from one needle to another, I really, the gauge does not look, or the, the stitches just don't look good. They're really loose and laddery right there beside each of those. So of course I know that's not gonna be acceptable. So I thought about how I could combat that. And I looked at my original chart and I had that decrease line running right along there. So when I switched to double pointed needles to knit this part in the round, it just, they naturally felt along that, that each and every, every third needle, well, every needle started with one of those double decreases. And then the second double decrease for the needle would be in the middle. So I decided, well, I'm going to rechart. It's the same thing. Well, I changed the pattern a little bit. The two motifs down here are the same, but I really didn't, like the, the the crown, the little designs within the, the wedges themselves. So I put um, a large star pattern in there instead. And I moved that decrease line right to the middle. It's the same chart, I'm just starting at a different spot. So that will keep those decreases in the middle of, when I switch to double pointed needles, it'll keep those decrease lines to the middle of my needle. So I'm not going to be switching from one needle to another and hopefully I can avoid 
that mistake or those ladders that that ended up on that hat. So that's been the big project for the week. You get that out of the way. But I think this was the most interesting thing that I learned from that, that even with the same size needles, if you switch techniques, you can change your gauge that way as well. I knew I knit tight on Magic Loop, but I didn't realize it was such a big difference. But anyway, that was interesting. And I've also started the hat, not the hat, the, the sweater for the Master Knitting Program. I'm just starting to choose my cables right now. Let's see if I can get these in there. I just started blocking out all of my swatches. I started with my stockinette swatch and I always do a big swatch. Like this is more than six inches side to side. So and all I do is I take like the, the ball band measurement and I, if it's in four inches, I divide it by four to get the, the stitch gauge for one inch and then I multiply that by six and that's how many stitches I cast on. I like to get a good six inch swatch and that will help me get my basic gauge. I'm not actually working any stockinette in this pattern. There will be some reverse stockinette between the cables, but most of like the filler in, in the sides on the sleeves where there are no cables, I'll be doing a moss stitch instead. I think that was the same number of stitches. I need to count, I'm not sure. And you can see, maybe it might be, it might be, I'm, I'm not quite sure if that's the same number of stitches. It certainly looks smaller. So. That I wanted to compare regular stockinette gauge with my other gauge. And then I chose the cables I want to use for the sweater. And I'm going to have like a central motif in the middle. That will be this one that will run right down the front of the sweater. And then I'm going to have little simple four cross cables on either side of it. And then this will, this one over here is, well, I, oh, it's really stuck on there. <laughs> I started out with one, I, well, I took this motif down here and I took out the sides, that side cable there, and I just kept the center. And I didn't quite like how it came out, and so I tried a different way. And then up here, trying to get these blocking pins out. Up here, I made a few more modifications, and I really like this part of it here. So that will probably go to each side of the central panel, and then along the sides, further away I'm going to have, we need to have baubles in our pattern as well. So I've been knitting, I think I, I knit a swatch with about nine bobble, different ways to do baubles. And then I chose the two I like the best. So I'll probably go with the bobble that's up here. So I think that looks really good. So those will run along the sides of the sweater and then fill in with moss stitch. And then the sleeves are probably going to have this panel with a rope cable to either side up along the sleeve and I'm going to do a saddle shoulder the kind that comes up between the front and the back to seam it to the neckline so that's all the knitting I've been working on working on that tam a lot of swatching this week so while I've got this camera set up I love to always recommend new books and resources and this week's resource is I'm not a fan of the names for these books, the For Dummies and Idiot's Guide and stuff like that, but the book itself, Knitting Sweaters by Megan Goodacre, is really a good introduction to sweater knitting. If you like to have a book on your shelf that has um, a lot of the basics, like the first part focuses on learning to knit sweaters, things you need to know before you begin, like your things, the, the yarn you should, you can use, the things you should have in your toolkit, and then a good section on um, reading patterns, the instructions, and how sweaters are constructed, and measurements and tailoring your knits, and, and a lot of different information that's important for sweater knitters, the importance of swatching, and if you want to knit a sweater that fits, then swatching is very important. Casting on, binding off, edgings, working in the round, shaping, blocking, joining, buttonholes, weaving in ends, all of that. So there's a lot of good information. And then there are quite a few different patterns as well. Some are more simple. Some are a little more um, advanced. I don't think any of them are really, really difficult. I'd say they're from beginner to intermediate. You've got the range in there. So lots of pretty sweaters from children's to men women too but what I really liked about this book was let me see if I can find it oh this page here where it talks about um 
the, the pattern, the section on reading sweater patterns. And it has a whole page of um, phrases that really trip people up, like um, what to watch for, like when a pattern says ending with a wrong side row, it explains exactly what that means. And knitting as in pattern as established or at the same time or work even, things like that, those things that seem to trip knitters up quite a lot. So if you're looking for a new knitting resource to add to your shelf, this is a good book to have. There, let me grab a quick drink. And if you're joining me, say hello in the chat. Tell me what you've been knitting. Maria is trying to knit a shawl. Well, good luck with that. Shawls are a fun project to work on. Okay, so we talked about what was being knit, some interesting news. Let's move on to the next thing on our list here. A few announcements. So um, we have, if you've, been on any of the previous live streams or if you're on the email list then you'll know that we're working on um, a workshop a two-week I think probably a two-week workshop and when I initially came up with this idea I thought about hosting it in a Facebook group because I thought that um, that would give us we could do the 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 live streams like we do here, but it would be in its own private group and then you could chat in between sessions and I could answer questions in there, things like that. So um, there's a lot of interest, but then I've had quite a few people tell me that they don't really use Facebook that much and they wondered if there was another way to access the workshop. So that got me thinking again, back to the drawing board because I'm not a huge fan of Facebook either. I don't use it very much. Um, and it was starting to feel like one more thing I'd have to keep up with and check. So my next thought would be um, we could live stream just like we are now, but instead of just being available to the public, because this is a private workshop, I can, I can um, have the videos unlisted on YouTube, which means they won't be showing up on like the Nerdy Knitting YouTube page or in your home stream when you're scrolling through YouTube or anything like that. The only, one to, only way to watch the video would be to um, have the, the link to the video. So, which work would work well because of course we're already on YouTube. Um, but I wanted to make it easy to manage because it would be more difficult to track down everybody in the workshop, make sure they have the link to attend the next session. So I think what I'll do is um, put the videos themselves right on a page on my website at Tanya Knits. And you can see the link right there for the workshop. If you're interested in joining the waiting list, then you can head to that link and there's a, just a simple sign up form with your email address in it. So when we're ready to go ahead with the workshop, then um, I'll contact everybody through that's on that list. <clears throat> so I think we'll host the class right there as well. <clears throat> Excuse me, got a frog in my throat. So instead of having to give you a link for every time we have the another session of the workshop, you can just go right to this website and it will be password protected. So all you have to do is have the password and you just log in on there and you can watch whatever session is going on and we'll have the chat and everything right there. So if that sounds like a better option for you right now, we don't have much interest. So. Um, I'm not sure if we'll be having the class or not. That's right now. I'm just gauging interest. If I have enough people interested, then we'll go ahead and we'll have this workshop. So it will be all about the first week will be all about um, reading stitches, understanding the difference between a, a basic stitch and a twisted stitch, how to work both of those, how to um, read different stitch patterns and understand the, the combination of knit and purl, how they work together to create different fabrics. That's really the foundation. If you don't understand that, then you're always going to be asking other people, how many stitches do I have? How many rows have I finished? I, I forgot to check and keep track. I'm not sure how many rows or, or things like that. Or even another common issue people have is they'll be working in the round on double pointed needles and they'll post a picture saying, I think I dropped a stitch between needles, but 
they didn't drop a stitch. It's just that they've got like a small ladder in between, but they don't understand how to look at their stitches. So this is really a foundational skill that all knitters need to have. And then the second week after we tackle that topic, the second week will be all about fixing mistakes. We will be knitting little swatches. You will have to do some homework, not very much. It's just a handful of tiny swatches. Um, but you want to practice these skills. You want to practice reading your stitches and we'll practice dropping stitches and picking them back up in different fabrics. And for the final class, we'll even have like a small lace swatch, really simple lace, but how you can take out a section of stitches and drop down and fix a, a whole section in a pattern as well. So we'll be covering a lot in this workshop. So if that's something that interests you, you can go to that link right there, tanyanits.com backslash backslash workshop and fill it in and <clears throat> excuse me fill in your email address and when we are ready to proceed or I have more information then I'll be contacting everybody on that list there okay so let's move on to questions we have a lot of questions to tackle today last week's community question I sort of or the last live stream I sort of ended it quickly because my computer was unplugged and the battery was about to die and it was new technology, I was having issues with it. So we didn't get to our community question, but this was the question that had been up over the summer and we started with that um, about the type of knitting needle material that you like to use. And these were the responses. By far, people like metal needles. And I agree, I love my Chowgu interchangeable four inch set. They're the shorter tips and I use them for almost everything. I do need to invest in some wooden double pointed needles though. When I do swatches for videos, my metal needles keep slipping and sliding right out of my stitches. So I need something with a little more grip. So let's look at the questions we've had submitted this week. We have four questions we're going to answer and then we're going to go into our topic, which is set in sleeve sweaters. So our first question for the week was from Emily. She wanted to understand how she could avoid holes in the underarm when making a raglan top-down sweater in the round. Now this all this works for pretty much any top-down sweater. Um, I think the biggest thing to understand is where to pick up the stitches because when you're first knitting, you're knitting in, okay, here's a small raglan sweater, a little baby one. So it started here and I worked down. So I was working in that direction so my stitches are actually upside down. But when you go to pick up for your armhole, you flip it around. Well, now the stitches are upside down, I mean. They are in the right direction here, but then you turn it upside down and that changes, you just, um, it changes where the direction of the stitches technically. But what we do is we look for the places to pick up the stitches, the, the main stitches. And you need to look, I've put a picture here, the black and white picture with those little black dots. That's where you would pick up the stitches for the underarm, no matter how, however many you, you have to pick up. Look for the columns of stitches, and each column of stitches looks like a V. Don't know if my mouse is showing up on the screen, but each of these Vs is a stitch, and this is a column of stitches right here. So you're going to pick up under the bars of your whatever cast on you use to cast on some underarm stitches. You'll pick up under those bars in each of those columns. And then you sometimes end up with holes to either side. Let me see if I can. Which one way to deal with them is just to use your yarn tails to weave them in. You can see I didn't, I'm sort of messed up right there where I picked up, but it's kind of almost seamless wherever that cast on edge, it's right here. But those were the stitches I picked up. And I do have little holes here, but I, I did a little bit more research this week because it's usually after you pick up those stitches, it's the sides right there where you end up with those holes. And it's because those stitches, you're knitting this direction, those stitches end up really stretched out and that's where you get those gaps right in there. So um, let me go back here. This video um, by Susan and Brian, she has a really interesting way to pick up those stitches using the the bars that are on either side and then decreasing right away so i put a link for that video down below and you can check it out if you want to learn more about the, that technique she uses but the biggest part is to pay attention to where you're picking up stitches make sure you're picking up so you get that seamless look it looks like a full column of stitches um, but then when you have 
that area right along either side, that's where you're going to get that that um, extra space, that hole. So she has a technique for picking up those stitches so you can close up that hole. Hopefully that is helpful to you. Emily, now our next question from Heidi. She wanted to know about the right side and the wrong side of your knitting. And then after more clarification, she wanted to know like um, how to tell when you're currently knitting what side is the right side and what side is the wrong side, how you can tell. So there are a few things you can do. Um, the first thing, well, the first few things are before you even start your project. Pay attention when you're casting on. Like this swatch right here. Obviously, I'm working in stockinette, so I know that this is the right side of the work. And my tail is right here. When I'm on the right side, that tail's on the left. So that's one of the first clues. No matter the fabric you're using, after you cast on and start your first row, whatever that... Um, fabric whatever if you're starting on the wrong side row or right side row pay attention to where the tail the yarn tail is in relation to that row so if you forgot to mark which side is the right side or the wrong side you can always look at that tail to orientate orient orientate yourself <laughs> to wherever you left off in your knitting you can even make a note in your pattern that the tail is on well like if i were going to write this down i would say tail on left side of needle. So I would know if I'm on a right side row, that tail should be over there, not over here. That's one thing you can do. Another thing you can do is after you've worked the first few rows, take a locking stitch marker and just put it on the front of the work somewhere. You're not marking like a specific stitch for any purpose. It's just gonna hang out there on the front. So you know, okay, oh, that's my right side. So whenever you see your stitch marker on the front, you know you're on the right side of the work. And another few options to keep track before you start are row counters like these. Let me get that up there. This little tiny one like this. You can find these on Amazon. I put a link down below for them. Um, this one has a hole that goes straight through it so you could slide on your needle. It's not going to fit on these US 10s. Oh, it will. Um, so if you're knitting on straight needles, you could put this between like the end stopper thing and it would stay right there on your needle while you're knitting. Or the um, another kind has like a little ring on it that you can attach to your circular knitting needle. Another one is um, one of these digital row counters. So if you like to use something like that, that will help, help you keep track of your rows and that will help you keep track of where you are in your pattern. Okay, now what if you've already cast on and you're not sure where you are? This is when you have to think about the fabric you're creating. If you have to, go look at the pattern itself and see what pictures there are and see what the fabric looks like. See if you can narrow it down. Here are a few different fabrics. Well, seed stitch, it is reversible. So if the pattern is completely straight, no shaping or anything like that, you can pick whatever side you want as the right side. Say it's a scarf, you can pick the right side. It's up to you. The patterns will use that reference, right side and wrong side, even for something that's reversible, because it just makes it easier to tell where you are in the pattern itself. So obviously stockinette has a definite right side that doesn't, looks very different than the wrong side. So that one is easier to tell. Knit one, purl one rib is another reversible pattern. And then garter stitch is also reversible. Two by two rib can be reversible. So it depends on the pattern specifically, which side is the right side row and which side is the wrong side row. Another thing you can do is um, look at the, the shaping. If it's a garment that has shaping along the sides, then look at those stitches, if they're increases or deep. Well, let's say you're, you're working some decreases and knit two together is going to lean off or a knit two together should lean off to the right. So look for those decreases and see which way they're leaning. And if you know you started with the knit two together at the beginning, then that, that should be leaning off to the right. If it's not, I'm not sure if you look at it from the other side, which way it would lean. I'll have to look into that. But just orient, orient it based on the shaping as well. So I hope that helps with your question, Heidi. 
And our next one, understanding how to use different yarn than what is called for in a pattern. Okay, the two basic things is the yarn thickness, and that's meant, well, um, well like how, how thick the strand itself is. They also call that the yarn weight. I'm not talking about the weight of one skein, but the weight or the thickness of a strand of yarn. And that is what gives you your gauge information. So that uh, that chart right there is the Craft Yarn Council's standard yarn weight system. Now, a lot of yarns in North America will have those little symbols, but they might not have that. But every yarn should at least have gauge information and knitting, knitting needle size recommendations. So you can figure out where it should fall based on that information. If it has a gauge of like 20 stitches to the inch, then it's probably going to be like a medium weight for yarn even if it doesn't have that symbol on there. So that's the first thing to look for. So if you're using a different yarn, you want to look for a yarn that falls within that same thickness, that, that same gauge. And the next thing to think about is fiber content because the designer hopefully thought about the, the attributes, um, the advantages, the disadvantages of all the different fibers. And that uh, the pattern or the that, sh that was designed um, should relate to those fibers in some way. So like you want a light summer tank top, um, then you're probably not gonna use like an air and wool, you know, like a heavy bulky weight wool, you're probably gonna use cotton or linen and really probably maybe a DK or a sport weight. Um, but if you want a nice warm winter sweater, you might choose that wool yarn in that bulky weight instead. So um, the, you wanna match the fiber content as closely as possible to keep it simple for yourself. Now, it is possible to use other fibers than what the pattern designer recommends or uses for the original design, but you're going to have to swatch and see how that fiber reacts. Um, and different fibers have different advantages, different disadvantages. In general, animal fibers are warmer and they have more elasticity. Wool has the most. Other animal fibers have less. Alpaca has less elasticity and will tend to droop. Um, but plant fibers in general are the opposite. They don't have much elasticity. Um, they're harder on your hands. That's You can feel the change in um, the fiber content right there when you're knitting because a lot of people will say it was really hard on their hands because cotton won't have that stretch in the give that wool will. Um, and it will. it's heavier and they tend to droop over time. So if a pattern was knit with 100% wool, um, and it has, say it's a seamless sweater, that wool has enough memory most likely to keep the shape that it was intended to be for the finished product. But if you decide to knit that in cotton instead, you're, you're going to have a seamless cotton sweater. It's going to get longer and heavier because cotton is actually heavier than wool as well. So it really is more difficult to change fiber but you can always research the different fibers and see what their attributes are before you make those decisions. Um, but my, my best recommendation is to stick with at least the, basically the same fiber category, like animal fibers or plant fibers, um, just to be on the safe side and swatch, 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 a large swatch, not a tiny one, like a good six inch swatch to see how that fabric is gonna behave. Um, and then some other things, there are other things you can check, like the ply of the yarn can be different from one yarn to another. If you go to yarnsub.com, and their, their um, program is great. You just type in the yarn that the pattern used, and it will spit out some recommendations for other yarns that you can use instead. But they really get detailed about why they're recommending those yarns, right down to like the put up of the yarn, the weight of the yarn, the fiber content. Um, the plies and all of that. So that's a good way to practice learning how to substitute yarns. But, um, and I also have a small little printable. It's uh, at tanyanits.com backslash library. You just sign up for the free resource library. There's lots of printables in there for like dishcloth patterns and some of the shawl tutorials we've done and a yarn substitution guide, which covers some of the basic things. Great question, Mary is using multiple yarns which are made of different fibers within one project a bad idea? It depends. Um, I think it would depend on the final care needs of the individual yarns themselves. For example, 100% wool, you can't put that in the washer and dryer because it will felt. 
but you can certainly do that with a lot of cottons. So it, it really depends on the fibers. I would look and see how they compare for like the final care of the garment, how it's going to be treated after. Because well, like linen is another example. Linen's a beautiful fiber. When you're knitting with it, it looks terrible and it really needs that good like um, agitation in the washing machine to look a lot better. But so you wouldn't want to combine that with wool that can't be agitated because of its um, likelihood of felting. So I would look at um, the different care needs in the fibers. But you could mix them, but you want to think about how you're going to care for that final project and how. So you could swatch them. I would definitely swatch them together and then treat that swatch how we're going to treat the final garment and see how those fibers react to being treated that way. And then you'll really understand. Swatching is really the best thing to do in so many situations. Okay, and then our last question before we dive into our discussion about set and sleeve sweaters. Um, I'm not going to address the short row part. That's a big topic. We'll save that for another day. But she did have a question about mirror knitting to do entrelac um, and like 10 stitch blankets. And oh, you're welcome, Mary. And anything where you have to do little sections, even short rows, like where you have to flip back and forth fairly quickly. So mirror knitting can also be known as um, knitting backwards, knitting back backwards, purling backwards. There's a lot of different names for it. So I'm going to start a swatch here and get right to the middle of it, working backwards. So I, I try this with my right hand and I can't do it with my right hand, um, but I usually knit with my left anyway. So it was really easy to switch. So I'm going to show you a quick demonstration of whatever you want to call it, knitting backwards, purling backwards, but I usually save this for when I'm working in stockinette because I know on my wrong side rows I have to turn around and I have to purl. And most of us don't love to do that. So instead of doing that, you can do what's called knitting back backwards, purling back backwards, or mirror knitting. There's a lot of different names for it. And a lot of people who teach left-handed people to knit might teach them this method to produce their fabric as well. But basically, I'm going to have to demonstrate this just with my left because I can't do it with my right hand. You're going to, and I only do it for purls. I can do it for a knit stitch, but it's just easier for a purl stitch. Your yarn's in the back. You're going to insert like this. Let me get up there so you can see. Wrap your yarn. Oh, my hand's in the way, just like that. Pull that new stitch through. And that is purling backwards. Now this is something anybody can teach themselves to do. Like to figure this out, all I did was I put the work the way I wanted it. I knew I was gonna purl this way. So I put the needle in first, like I'm gonna purl. So I know this is where my yarn has to be, it has to be back here. And this is what where this, the needles go to purl a stitch. So I held it there and I turned it around. So I could see, oh, okay. So when I'm purling in this direction, I'm taking that left needle and going behind the right needle like that. So while it was also there, I would come back around this way and I got that part down. So I put my needle in and then I wrapped the yarn and paid attention to where that was and I turned it around. So now if I look, I know the yarn has to come up and around like that. And then I'll hold it there and I pull this, I use the right needle to sort of pull that one over. And that is purling backwards. So I'll work a few more, insert like that. So this is great if you're doing any project, short rows, baubles, um, those 10 stitch blankets where it's just a few stitches and you have to go back and forth and you don't wanna keep flipping your work back and around all the time. Entrelock. I don't, I can like, I mean, it's simple enough to do like say a purl two together. I mean, you just insert and you do two stitches. So it's possible to do decreases and increases like this. So that is purling. So I use it mostly for that when I'm working lots of stock in it and I don't want to turn the work around. But you can do the knit stitch that way as well. And people change the name of it. Like some people will, will try to, they'll, they wanted to correct me and say, well, you're, you're knitting backwards. I'm like, well, technically I'm making a purl stitch. Like if I were doing it this way, it would be a purl. So it's 
it's I, I call it purling backwards because I am I'm creating a purl stitch just in a different direction so what if I wanted to knit instead if I want a knit stitch on the front then I know the yarn has to be on this side so from the front it's over here and I'm going to insert like this so I can turn that around and look at that so there's the yarn in the front and I've inserted okay brought that left needle from this direction to make a knit stitch so while it's there find my yarn wrap like I'm going to knit just like that so hold that there and turn it around again so I can see what's going on here okay so the needles going in this way and I'm bringing the yarn this way to create that knit stitch so you can do a knit stitch that way I just find it a little more challenging but it's making a knit stitch but it looks like a purl stitch on this side of the fabric obviously so you insert like that wrap the yarn so you can do that as well but I use it mostly when I have to purl because it's a just a really fast way to purl when you don't want to turn your work every two seconds okay does anybody have any questions before we pop into our demonstration about sweaters with cap sleeves oh that last stitch come on get on there <laughs> but this is really easy to learn you just have to sit down and look at where your needles are where they get inserted how you wrap the yarn and then practice like maybe cast on one of those 10 stitch blankets to really get a good feel for how that is done so if there aren't any questions we'll go right to our topic this week Ooh, we're already 40 minutes in goodness So why don't you go ahead and tell me what you're knitting this week, and if you have any questions, we can talk about them when we're all done. I'm gonna go right to our slideshow here and talk about sweater construction. So we have covered seamless yoke, raglan, drop shoulder sweaters, and this week we are tackling set in sleeves. And like the other sweaters, they can be worked in either direction. You can work them from the bottom up. You can work them from the top down. They can be seamless, worked in the round with, it's a lot different, of course, than like a yoke sweater or a raglan sweater, because you've got to do a lot more things to get a set in sleeve. And they can also be worked in pieces, and that's probably the most common method. Before we dive in, though, I'll go back here, because I just wanted to explain what a set in sleeve was. Um, where the seam sits right on your shoulders. It doesn't droop off your shoulder like a drop shoulder would. Um, it doesn't have those uh, increases or decreases coming diagonally from the underarm. It has specific seams right along the shoulders and that's where they should be for a good well-fitting set in sleeve sweater <laughs> okay so there are many ways to do it just like all of the other types of sweaters okay so here's a little diagram of that this is from nitty if you want to read more or look at more schematics for different types of sweater construction um, they are most commonly done seamed bottom up in pieces like all the pieces are, are knit separately and then they are seamed together that gets a well fitted garment and of course to knit something like this you definitely need to knit a swatch and know your gauge because you want that sleeve to fit well but they can also be done seamless top down there are lots of different methods um, Coco Knits Julie Weissenberger she has one where she has like an English tailored style set in sleeve um asa trucosa i'm not sure i'm pronouncing her name right um has another method for creating that set in sleeve there's lots of different ways that they can be done there's lots of different creative things that knitters have done to make them as seamless as possible because knitters love to do those um, seamless knits that they can try on as they go but there can also be done in a combination of uh piece and seamed um you might knit the body in the round and then do the after the seams the shoulders are seamed pick up stitches and work the sleeve down using short rows um, there's lots of different combinations so we're going to look at all of those we'll start with the most basic which is the seamed sweater so you work on all of the pieces generally knit from the bottom 
to the top, but you can knit them from the top down. And then you block each of the pieces. That's the best thing to do to get them seamed properly. If, if, if you, they're all curling in on each other, it's really hard to seam them properly. And then the hardest part is getting the sleeve to sit in there. But that if you have a lot of locking stitch markers, that's the best thing to use and get the sleeve in there the way you like with the stitch markers. And then you can seam it right up. And Amy Herzog has a really great tutorial. Um, Patty Lyons has one too right here on YouTube if you want a video tutorial. Okay, now if you're going to do them seamless top down, or well, I mentioned um, other methods to do them. One way to do that is to knit the, the front and the back separately until you reach the armhole depth that you want. And then you begin knitting the body in the round. Or if it's a cardigan like this picture, you would knit the body still flat back and forth in rows. And then you would seam the shoulders together. Once that's done, you would pick up the stitches around the armhole and you would work short rows to get that, that sleeve cap at the top, that fitted shape. There's a link right there to Quince & Co that talks about that a little bit and another method they use. Um, and you can combine different methods. You can knit the body in the round to the armholes and then you'd have to knit the front and back separately to the shoulders and then seam them together. And then from there you can work the sleeves. You can pick up stitches and use that short row shaping. You could knit them flat and seam them to the body. And then another option at this link at Emma Welford, she talks about how um, she uses decreases to create the, the sleeves from the bottom up. Okay, so here are a few examples of some sweaters. The first one is by Brooklyn Tweed, Hugo. Now this one is worked flat in pieces and then seamed together. So we've got all of those really pretty cables all over. And I think it's easiest to design a sweater, a cable sweater like that, flat in pieces, because I like to work cables, um, in flat knitting because those wrong side rows are generally just you know knit knit your knit stitches purl your purl stitches um but you don't get accidental crossed cables when i'm knitting them in the rounds i have to really pay attention to make sure i'm crossing my cables in the right place because i'm usually not crossing cables on the wrong side rows but in flat knitting that's very obvious when you're knitting in the round it's not so obvious but that second sweater like this the body is worked flat and seamed, and then the sleeves are worked in the round. So I really like the hem, that shirt tail hem on that one. And then that last purple lavender sweater, that one is worked in the round top down and the sleeves are integrated as you work the sweater body itself. So these are all sweaters with set and sleeves, but the way they are constructed is completely different. And you can also knit cardigans with set and sleeves. They can be worked in both directions, just like the um, regular pullover sweaters. And they can be worked flat or they can be worked in the round. If they're worked in the round, most likely you'll use the steak stitches to cut up the cardigan open in the front. And then like the sweaters, the, the, the sleeves can also be worked separately. They can be uh, seamed, they can be made with short row shaping. All of those same rules apply to cardigans as well. And here's a few examples of those. Uh, the Dockside Cardigan by Amy Herzog. Now this one is worked in pieces from the bottom up and seamed. And the second sweater, Dogwood Blossoms. Now this one is worked in the round. And of course, you're going to have to cut the front open to add your button band and make it a cardigan. And um, the last one by Isabel Kramer. The body is knit flat from the top down. And then the sleeve stitches are picked up and the sleeve cap is shaped with short rows. So three very different sweaters, three very different constructions. There, so that is our presentation. And a few fewer patterns this time. It seemed like a lot of patterns to go through the last few times. So I thought I would condense it a little bit. Okay, Gail, you've got a question. Does a knitted garment need to be blocked every time it is washed? This is a great question. I think it's really about um, understanding the different knitting terms because washing can be blocking. Blocking is just applying some form of water, be that in the shape of soaking or spraying or steaming and allowing the project to dry. Um, I'm thinking you probably, you might mean like where you have to use something to stretch it out, like something that has lace or something like that. Um, which you would need to do that. 
every time you'd have to pin it and stretch it depending on where the lace is. I have a um, a pullover that I wear and it has like lace along the edge of the sleeve and along the bottom. And after I wash it and lay it out to dry, I have one of those shower on uh, a sweater rack that has like the mesh so it can dry from both sides. I do um, pull the bottom and the sleeves a bit to try to open up the lace. And if it doesn't open up as much as I like when the sweater is done drying, I will put those bits on blocking mats and, and pin them and steam them just to open them up a little bit more. But you don't need to use pins and wires every single time. Like for most of my sweaters, um, a lot of them are wool and even the cotton ones, it will just, well, the, the wool ones I put on the gentle cycle in my washing machine, um, it doesn't agitate at all. It like rotates the, the middle thing in the drum like once or twice in the whole cycle. And that's it. So, but I like that it, it spins them dry and they, they dry much faster than if I soaked them by hand. Um, and then after, well, if it's a wool sweater, I, and most of my cotton sweaters, unless there's something that says they can go in the dryer, they come out of the, the wash on the gentle cycle and they go on that drying mat. And I just like put them back into whatever shape I want them to be. And that is plenty, but some things and for socks, the same, I don't, I don't use sock blockers. That's what my feet are for. I don't want my socks all stretched out. I want them to fit my feet. Um, I might do that as well for. For the things I know that need to be stretched out, like lace, or well, like this fair aisle that I'm working on, um, when I wash that, I actually grab a dinner plate and I put the dinner plate inside it to help stretch it out the way I, the shape I want it to be. Um, so stranded knitting, lace, cables, I try to sort of push them back together. Like, let me see if I can show this one again. Like I pin them out, um, but I sort of wiggle my fingers in there and push the cable together to keep it. I want, I like that definition on the cable. So I want, I don't want it to be really stretched out and flat. So I will put my fingers in there and sort of push the, push it together where I think it should be. Um, and I would do that on my sweaters. When I lay them out to dry, I will go along and just make sure everything looks good so it can dry the way I want it to dry. Um, you're welcome, Gail. I hope that answered your question. It looks like we've talked about everybody's questions. So we have a new community question this week. Um, I wanted to know about your first projects. You can leave that in the chat. You can leave it, I'll pin a comment down below, either this evening or tomorrow, or um, you can hop right over, I'll have the link for that uh, on the community page and you can leave your comment there. We've had a lot of comments already. But my first project was a little dishcloth and. Oh, it's here somewhere. I've shown it before. I'm not sure where it is. My daughter keeps taking it because she likes to laugh at it because it looks terrible. Because the my tension was way, oh, I was so, so tight that it's one of those dishcloths that start at a point and then you go out this way and then come back in. And the point is not pointed at all. It's completely round because I was so tight on those stitches. So if you want to share about your first project, go over there and tell me about it. And as always, we have knitting resources for you. There's short 60 second videos. You'll find a whole playlist of them. If you need a refresher for a particular cast on or increase or decrease, then it's probably in that list. If it's not there, send me a message and I'll make a note to do a short video of that. Sometimes you don't want a 15 minute video about how to do the long tail cast on. You just want to see it demonstrated really quickly. And that's what those are for. If you need help learning how to read your stitches, I have a free guide for that. And if you have serious knitting help or your project is a complete disaster and you need more help, I have a program called Knitting 911 where I can create a personalized video for you and walk you through whatever your problem is. Or if you want personalized help for a specific knitting technique or topic, then I can make a video about that as well. So you'll find links for those. And before we end, I just want to say thank you to Mary and Chanel and Colette and Amy for buying me a coffee this week. I was able to purchase a new webcam recently, which was a nice upgrade from the one built right into my laptop. So we have better quality for the live stream. Next on the list is some lights because um, we live in sort of like a half basement where I record. And if it's really dark, like today is really dark and rainy and I was planning to record some videos, but it's just too dark. So I can't, even with like lights on everywhere, it just looks terrible. 
So my next purchase will be some light. So all of the money that I raised through that link. So I appreciate all of the support you get for being here, hanging out with me for the live streams, liking the videos, commenting, chatting. This is just another way to support the channel. And if you have more knitting questions that you would like to have answered, then you can leave your comments, especially if you are catching the replay. Leave your comments down below the video right here, or you can hop right over to the community page, look for that picture I just showed, and um, leave your comment there. And we will address them in the next video. And we've got lots of topics to cover. If you have ideas for more things we can talk about, we're almost finished with our discussion about the different ways to construct sweaters. So if there's a specific topic you'd like to hear more about, then leave me a comment, send me a message, let me know, and I'll add it to the list of ideas. And that's it for today. We'll be back for our next live stream in two weeks. So until then, get your knitting questions ready to be answered in that video. And I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> so we'll see you in two weeks.